Thank you, Jonathan. Um, really, I'm not going to give a big introduction. I'm glad you all could come out here, and Rackspace is happy to have you here and happy to host this event, and really happy to bring Robert here and have him meet some of the technology companies here. Um, you know, really a man who is world famous for taking Google Glass into the shower really needs <laughs> no introduction. Um, some things about that you may not know, Robert and I actually have a lot in common, both named Robert, of course, both born in 1965, both work for Rackspace. And if you take my number of followers on Twitter and my number of followers on Facebook and multiply them by 100,000, you'll get his number of Facebook followers <laughs> and his number of Twitter followers. <laughs> so anyway, I'm very pleased to welcome fellow Racker to Blacksburg, and I hope you'll enjoy his talk on Beyond Mobile. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. <laughs> I can find my slides here. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, what a week I've had. I just got here from the University of Illinois where I saw some mind-blowing stuff. I'm, I, I feel like I'm on a university tour this week to figure out what's uh, the, the future is coming. So some of these slides have been updated lately. Um, so I have a unique role in the world, and I'm really sort of intimidated because there's some real pioneers in this audience who uh, uh, usually when I give a talk, the audience doesn't have a clue whether I'm telling them something good or bad, but uh, we have some of the people who have built self-driving cars since 2007 in the audience, and some of the people who run the VR uh, research labs at uh, Virginia Tech. And I have a, a unique role. I get to go around the world and talk to startups like this is the founder of Meta who's making uh, augmented reality glasses and came out of Israeli military where he built these kinds of glasses for the jet fighter pilots over in Israel. And I, I do so many interviews. In the last four days I've interviewed uh, 20, more than 25 startups or 25 companies. And so I get a, a, a lot of knowledge that's a, an inch deep but a mile wide. And so I get to see patterns that sometimes people who are just working in one field don't get to see. And this talk is sort of an example of that. I'm now seeing <coughs> that in the next five years, we're gonna get a variety of technologies that are gonna devalue the mobile screen. So we're gonna look at the mobile screen less and less thanks to virtual reality, thanks to augmented reality, things, thanks to things like Amazon Echo. And we'll talk about some of them. And because the quality of this audience is so high, I expect that this talk will kick off a conversation. I hope you guys get involved as, a, as we go through the talk. Um, so, well, that's interesting. The slides are, oh, some of the slides might not work very well. Sorry about that. I didn't know I was on a four by three screen. I wrote a book called Age of Context three years ago, which was uh, seen as one of the more important books in, in predicting things like Google Now uh, and other technologies that predict what we're going to do next thanks to the mobile phone. So uh, we have seven sensors in our pocket and that really brought a pretty sizable shift to the kinds of software that people are writing uh, to the world. And the next shift is going to be an even bigger one. So this is a room where, where uh, Stereo Labs has pointed two cameras at the room and it's drawing uh, a mat uh, on those surfaces. So when you get an augmented, this is the building blocks of augmented reality. This is what is going on in the technology underneath it. So when you wear a Microsoft HoloLens or a Magic Leap glass or a Meta or an ODG glass and you're looking around the world like we did at the Cube today, it's building these little polygons on the floor with sensors uh, Right now, they're using active sensors that spit light out and measure how long it takes to get back to the glass. In the future, it's just going to be two cameras. And <clears throat> the Mercedes car is doing this. As you drive down the road, it's building a map of uh, the world and trying to build a 3D model of the world. And we're going to be wearing glasses soon that do this. Our wowie little toys are going to do this uh, as they move around the world and more and more. But anyways, th this is... Um, 
a shift uh, because uh, Stereo Labs is using two cameras to build this depth map, which is, are very low cost sensors, and they're doing this kind of um, geometry in the GPU. And so this is the building block of stuff that we'll talk about. How many, how many people have seen Magic Leap? Anybody in here? Oh my god. Are you serious? Seven people in this audience? I've never been in an audience with more than one. So that tells you the kind of quality of this audience. And maybe some of you can tell me about the experience. But Magic Leap is a pair of glasses that you look through and it augments the world and it puts virtual objects properly occluded. So you, you will see this thing go underneath the table and so it has sensors on it to figure out what the real world is, and it puts that stuff over on top of it. Uh, Ted Shilwitz, the futurist at 20th Century Fox, said this is Google's first trillion dollar idea, and Google has invested half a billion dollars in this company. Why would he say that? Because in five or ten, whenever years that this thing comes out, maybe sooner, you're going to wear it walking around and it's gonna do things. It's gonna let us play Minecraft on that table. It's gonna tell me things about you when I walk closer to you. It's going to uh, do whatever we as humans can dream up that we wanna have displayed in our eyes as we live our lives. We can put CNN on this carpet. We can do whatever we want. And this is uh, one of the interesting technologies coming. This is ODG's new augmented glasses. Now, <coughs> ODG started in San Francisco. They built these glasses for the military for a while. And um, the R6 glasses that we were playing with at the Cube this afternoon have a screen that looks like this in front of us. And it puts a virtual, a virtual layer on top of the real world. So you're looking through the glass. It's two 720p screens. Um, and it augments the world. The R7 looks like this, and the new ones that they showed me at CES are widescreen, like a 100-inch screen in front of you. So the image is getting sharper every year. It's getting wider. They're using less power. They have more GPU on the device, uh, and the costs are coming down. So you start drawing a trend line, and you say three years from now, that's gonna be a consumer product. Right now, it's still a $3,000 pair of glasses. But they have now enough compute power on them to do some really imaginary, imaginative augmented reality. Caterpillar is using these to look at a tractor with a mechanic and augment the tractor and tell the mechanic how to fix the thing, right? And you start thinking, what, what will happen when this consumerizes, when this gets to where we all can afford it? We're gonna do all sorts of stuff like that. We're gonna look at devices, we're going to go to shopping, we're going to uh, go to movies or entertainment experiences, and they're going to expand. Apple just bought a company called Matayo. When I interviewed Matayo uh, in Germany four years ago, they put monsters on buildings with their glasses, with their technology, right? So you think about what this 17-year-old uh, is going to see in the next five years. It's going to be quite extraordinary. This is me wearing the glasses. This is a different technology from Copen. So you saw the Google Glass. The Copen screens are much smaller. They're sharper, they're lighter. They use uh, far less battery. These glasses last, I think, eight hours on battery. The Google Glass would only last 45 minutes when I kept it on full time. Um, <clears throat> and the costs are coming down. So here's the Recon Instruments down here, which is the company Intel bought. This is the Copen up here. You can see that sizes are shrinking every year and getting smaller, and the displays are getting better. Uh, Snapchat bought this guy's company, Epiphany Eyewear. They put a 1080p camera inside the sunglass frame, and the rumors are they're going to launch that camera as a connected camera coming out this year, but they're going to have a very high-resolution camera in a very small package that the kids are all going to use at concerts and other places. Uh, and that's what the innards of the Epiphany eyewear glass look like, and that was two years ago. <clears throat> you think about virtual reality and what's coming. Uh, this is Va Valve's uh, Vive that I saw at CES. 
You have controllers that are very high resolution. They, uh, they are seen in space, so you can play uh, all sorts of sports or shooting or punching or grabbing kinds of games. Um, and you're in a, very, a fairly high resolution monitor and you're being watched by two sensors on your walls. So you gotta mount some sensors up on your wall to get one of these set up properly. That then builds a virtual uh, box of about 16 feet by 16 feet that you can walk around in. And it, it's sort of like the cube. If you guys get to go over to the cube over at uh, Virginia Tech, they have a huge room with a lot of this technology. But your living room's gonna have this. And they let me walk around a fish tank and interact with fish and draw uh, new kinds of sculptures with my hands, and it's mind-blowing. Um, pretty expensive right now. The, the Oculus Rift version of this is uh, $599 for the headset. We don't know what the controllers are going to cost, but let's say those are going to be $400. Bucks. And the PC that you need is a fairly high-end gaming PC. So I figure $1,500 bucks for a decent one and $3,000 for the one you really want, right? And it's gonna be an investment. There's lots of products because the screens are shrinking and getting uh, sharper and sharper. This is the Avagant Glyph that's not really optimized for VR, but has two screens so you can watch movies in a very high resolution screen. Um, and it's uh, about $600 for this product. And so think about taking a, a, a trip on a plane, and instead of uh, looking at your Mac screen or your iPhone, you're going to have a pair of these on and watch a movie inside these. It also lets you work privately. So if you're working at, in defense or something like that, and you want to make sure nobody's looking at your uh, slide deck over your shoulder, you can use this and, and work on, uh, in 1080p space. It's pretty high quality uh, screens there. We're starting to see marketers uh, hand these things out. Absolute Vodka had a, 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 a promotion where they handed 5,000 of these out to people to watch a live music concert. And they said the average time spent in these was 19 minutes, which they said was extraordinary for an experience at home with a brand. And so there's going to be more of these. Because these, uh, these are based on the Google Cardboard. The Google Cardboard is an open source standard. And you can go to China and make your own. And they cost about 2 or $3 a piece, which uh, is not too bad for an alcohol company who wants to have brand uh, uh, experiences. The cameras are coming down in cost. This was at Consumer Electronics Show. These guys showed me a new stereo 360 degree camera that will cost less than $1,000. Uh, for anybody who's seen some of my videos, I took the first 3D, 360 degree camera to Coachella, for instance, back in April. And the camera I was using had six GoPros on it <clears throat> and cost about $5,500 for the whole thing because you needed stitching software and uh, you needed a, a way to hold these things together in an accurate way. And this is going to be $700 and it does 3D. Mine does, doesn't do 3D. Mine only does 2D th 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 spherical video. And um, this is coming out from views uh, later this year. On the high end, for the m movie producers, there's new kinds of cameras from Lytro and from Jaunt and from Google that have m more cameras around uh, higher resolution. And then they're doing really amazing stuff in the cloud computing because they're going to throw this up to a su supercomputer, the videos off these 18 cameras. And then they're going to build 3D models of the world that it captures. So think about all the technology that went into the latest Star Wars. They virtually built that movie in a computer, if you watch the video that was on Engadget this weekend. Every scene was literally layers of buildings that were built by art, art, digital artists. And they're going to use com cameras like this to capture the room, digitize it, and turn it into a 3D point cloud, and then manipulate that in the, in the, in the uh, software that they use to make movies. And movies are going to change. Ted Chilowitz <coughs> showed me a new movie with Reese Witherspoon. And she walked into the movie. I was watching in an a Oculus Rift headset. And she walked into the movie and sat down and said some lines. And I was looking around. We were in a forest. It was really cool. And then he said, OK, let's play the movie again. And this time, 
instead of just looking at her, I want you to turn around and look at the rock behind you and then turn around and then look at the rock again. The movie changed because uh, just the act of moving my head was captured by software. There was an event that got fired and a different video started playing behind me. So the movie changed based on my behavior watching the movie. I, no longer are we going to watch movies from beginning to end. We're going to walk around in movies and we're going to interact with them, right? <clears throat> Some of the other things that are coming along is Internet of Things. Um, how many people have an Amazon Echo here? All right, this is weird. Seven of you have seen Magically, but only two have an Amazon Echo. That's cool. Do you guys like it? Love it. Every single person I call on in an audience who has one of these things says they love it. What do you guys do with it? So you say, Alexa, what's the weather? Yeah. Alexa, timer. Alexa, please set my timer to five minutes. So you can, uh, Alexa, set my timer for burner one to five minutes. So Alexa, set my burner time for burner two to three minutes, something like that. Oh, Alexa, tell me a joke. Right? Alexa, play the Beatles. Uh, Alexa, are you single? And she answers, I'm attached to the wall. <laughs> and I'm like, that's funny. Um, so it has a sense of humor. Uh, but uh, increasingly, you can control anything that's uh, digital in your house. Uh, uh, Alexa, turn on my lights in the bathroom. Alexa, turn on my lights in the kitchen. If you have Hue lights, you can set them up to do that. Alexa, change the Nest thermostat to 74 degrees, stuff like that. And there's apps now that people are building for these things. So you can, uh, you can write an app and impel it to run the, the app uh, based on this. There's eight microphones in this thing. Here's me from the next room over. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing. And it reads you the news and, oh yeah. And it lets you buy stuff. <laughs> So Alexa, buy, uh, buy me some toilet paper. It says, uh, on your profile, the last time you bought toilet paper, you bought Charmin, da 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 and it cost $17 to buy another case of it. Would you like that? Yes, Alexa. What's your code? <laughs> Give it your code. Ordered, and in two days, the, the toilet paper shows up, right? There's new buttons that Alexa's uh, selling called Dash Buttons. Uh, you can buy Dash Buttons for a variety of different products, like sandwich bags, or Tide soap for your uh, washing machine. And you push the, put that uh, Tide button over your washing machine, and when you notice you're running low on Tide soap, you push the button, two days later, Tide soap shows up, right? Um, and they just made some deals with printer companies that the printer will automatically order ink for the printer when it gets low. So you no more ordering ink for things, and you can think about how products are gonna shift because of this, right? Um, <clears throat> you think about how the Internet of Things is changing companies and uh, products. So th this guy, I uh, uh, visited Cantaloupe, Cantaloupe Systems in San Francisco, and his dad started maintaining vending machines 30 years ago because he couldn't do anything else. He arrived as an immigrant in, in the country without any money and uh, without education, and he could keep vending machines going. And the, the kid uh, goes to Harvard or somewhere and, um, and says, this is stupid. And he said, it's stupid for a whole lot of reasons, right? The person who has to maintain a vending machine has to walk up to the vending machine, open the door, count how many Diet Cokes sold um, and how many Snicker bars and how many whatevers and go down to the truck. The truck has to carry the entire inventory for not just this vending machine, but all the vending machines that truck is going to visit today. And he has to uh, grab 13 Diet Cokes and four Snickers bars or whatever, go back up to the machine, fill them up, and stuff like that. He also <clears throat> doesn't know when this thing sold out. So if it was a hot week and it sold out a Diet Coke in 10 minutes, it sat there for a week empty not maximizing profits. So he, bought, uh, he, he went to Jasper and put a Jasper card in there, uh, Internet of Things card, and hooked it up. And now he sa saves millions of dollars in his business because now when you order a Diet Coke, it goes into the cloud and tells the warehouse, which is where everything's stored, oh, this machine needs some Diet Cokes. They put the Diet Cokes into a bin 
and the bin goes straight to this specific machine and gets filled up. So no more round trips, no more multiple trips. No, the truck doesn't need very much inventory, so it doesn't get ripped off, and it doesn't get parking tickets anymore, on and on and on and on. So you think about how just a little technology shift radically changed a business, right? I just was at John Deere's R&D Center, and you're talking about <coughs> the future of farming and tractors, and I met with the guy who started Agrable, um, and he said 20 years ago when he wrote his thesis, uh, and he wanted to, um, re to analyze a, a day's worth of data, and, and data being satellite data, Doppler radar, radar data, and other data about the farm, just one day's worth of data took him two years to analyze. And today, 20 years later, it takes him two seconds to analyze that same data. So he, can now, he now is growing virtual crops to tell the farmer what is going to happen next week on his farm. In other words, how, what, you know, what the weather pattern is going to be that's going to affect the crop and what he, that farmer needs to do. Does the farmer need more nutrient on the soil? or uh, do other things to protect his crop. And he, he already has 80 employees, right, growing like a weed. But John Deere is, uh, uh, if you've been in a combine, these are uh, uh, almost a million dollars for these tractors. They have a lot of self-driving technologies in them because they're uh, driving themselves pretty much. And they also have sensors to read the soil types to know exactly how much fertilizer to put in the ground uh, and on and on. And they're developing new products that are going to have Internet of Things in the field. So they're going to have base stations and then sensors in the, gra in the ground. 3M said today uh, average farm has zero sensors per acre. And in 10 years, they predict 10 to 50 sensors per acre are going to be in the average farm to optimize uh, what the farmer does there. You think about manufacturing and how it's changing thanks to robotics. I visited... Uh, <clears throat> a, a, a factory where they're, um, th they have uh, cameras that are watching the workspace and projectors that are teaching the workers what to do to build a new motherboard in real time and they're timing them and they're watching them to make sure they're accurate on and on. And humans are still going to be a piece of manufacturing, but uh, increasingly the robot is going to assist them in manufacturing. You think about how Internet of Things is changing our lives. This company, uh, Lively, is a product you buy for your senior parents, and it, you put a sensor on their pill bottle, a sensor on their refrigerator door, and a sensor on their front door. And all it does is warn you if, if your parents don't wake up, don't get out of their bed. Because if they don't get out of bed, they don't touch the pill bottle, they don't touch the front door, and they don't take their walk. And it saved four lives that we know of already. So, because people get sick and they don't get out of bed and then you call on them and see that they're not feeling well and you get them to the hospital. Um, Internet of Things simplified, right? I forget what this slide was for. I saw this uh, hospital of the future in Dubai uh, using Internet of Things and watching all sorts of stuff. Oh, just this morning there was a new uh, sensor from Panasonic that uses micro millimeter radar and can see your heartbeat from across the room. So they know your heartbeat when you walk in the hospital and they know whether, right? So the doctor's going to have a lot of information in the future that they don't have today and that's going to change our lives and save our lives. Dog dishes are going to have this stuff built into it. This is a company that has Internet of Things, a little Bluetooth radio and a little uh, digital scale and reports that your dog isn't eating their food or is eating their food too much or something like that. Actually, I saw a new game, a, a new device that uses this kind of technology at CES to play a game with your dog all day long so that they have something to do and it re rewards them at appropriate times with a pellet of food. We're soon going to be wearing Internet of Things. This is a device that tells you to stand up straight and uh, watch your posture. Uh, we're going to have devices in our garden that are going to watch all sorts of uh, stuff in our garden. Uh, we're going to have sensors that are watching the air pollution. Now, here the air is fairly clean, but if you're in Beijing, the air is pretty dirty. And so... Um, having a sensor on you to watch that and warn you, hey, maybe you should uh, stay home today or maybe you should um, 
uh, wear a mask or something like that um, is a hot thing in China. And it'll be increasingly hot here too, particularly if you have kids who have asthma. Um, they actually, <clears throat> there was one study that uh, used technology like this to watch asthmatic kids walking to school and they found that in some neighborhoods the uh, pollution changed enough that if they walked them around uh, one block that they would have fewer asthmatic attacks and use less drugs on their kids. We're seeing new kinds of uh, visual search engines to prepare for this new oncoming world. This is a company called Blipar and they've made a deal with all sorts of uh, different brands. So you aim Blipar at a Lucky Charms and it augments, it does something with the box. And it's so good that when, when the CEO was on stage with me at Web Summit, he brought two live dogs out and he said, okay, try the, try the blip bar on the two dogs. And it knew the breeds of the dogs just by aiming the, the camera at the, at the two dogs. So it told me one's a Pomeranian and told me all sorts of stuff about that breed and one was another breed. Um, <clears throat> later today, we, we might get uh, really into self-driving cars because one of the pioneers is in the audience. But I got a ride in the first Mercedes uh, E-Class that's coming out that has a lot of self-driving features and it drove us around the um, desert for an hour and a half without anybody touching the steering wheel. And so that tells me this stuff is coming and it's coming fast and he verified it by the way. <laughs> and it's doing stuff already that the lawyers aren't comfortable with. They turned it off. Actually, the shipping car that you buy has the technology in the car to self-drive, but they've turned it off for you. Uh, you have to uh, be uh, a researcher to turn on the bleeding edge. And Tesla is doing the same thing. Elon Musk has turned off features because they're too scary to let humans have right now because we're breaking the rules and we're uh, getting in the back seats of cars while all these things are driving down the road. And the, the law does not allow that in most states. The law, actually, in, in, even in Nevada, requires a human to touch the wheel every 30, 30 seconds and actually be there to take over the car in case it does something uh, incorrect. But it's coming, and we can talk a lot about how these things work. Um, I forget why I put the gratuitous Tesla picture in there. <laughs> But Tesla certainly is uh, one of the early adopters of this. <clears throat> I visited uh, uh, David Hall, who invent, invented the uh, Velodyne LiDAR, which is on top of the Google self-driving car. So the LiDAR has 80 lasers that sweep 30 times a second and makes a digital map of the world, which you can see over there. Actually, does anybody know who, what, what Velodyne did before this? Yeah, he made the Velodyne subwoofer. <laughs> and I sold his subwoofer in the 80s in my consumer electronics store. So I was real thrilled to meet him because he, he made the best subwoofer in the 80s that you could buy because he was uh, better at digital signal processing than anybody even back then. Um, when you meet with the Google teams and, and others who are doing this kind of work, they're using the sensors on the car and, and in particular the LiDAR here, to look at the humans and look at the line markings and look at the signs and uh, start making maps of the world and then making predictive models of what everything is going to do on the street. So if there's a bicycle, you guys should watch uh, the, the Google video from Ted in February, you can find it on Google. And it predicts like a bicyclist next to the car how likely is that bicyclist going to be going straight? Or how likely is it, what's the chances that it, that bicyclist is going to come into the path of the car, right? And it's predicting everything on the street. And so if a, if a kid is over here, it sees the kid, and all the cars do, by the way. When we were driving around with the Mercedes, it saw pedestrians even off the roadway and was trying to predict what that, that pedestrian would do. So if the kid started running into the street and it starts predicting that car, the kid is gonna get into the street, it starts slowing down and preparing to uh, take a, a base of action because the kid's in the street. And the holy grail is they, we need to understand what the human is trying to tell the car, 
right? Because there's a lot of communication with pedestrians on the, on the streetway that we do with each other. We look into each other's eyes and go, are you going to walk across or are you going to stay there, you know? And, and the pedestrian does the same thing to us, right? They're like, are you going to run me over or are you going to stop, you know? And we look at each other and try to predict each other's behavior before we take action. And the, the Google car is actually making a, a, an augmented, uh, an artificial intelligence system to map out human, known human behavior and predicted human behavior. So when a cop is saying like this, it knows what to do and it doesn't just sit there and embarrass you. We're going to see all sorts of new kinds of infrastructure. I was just over at the VIIT, I think it's called, Virginia Institute of Transportation. And we were talking about car-to-car -car communication and car-to-infrastructure communication. There's going to be lots of infrastructure like this parking sensor that senses whether there's a car on top of the sensor or not. But one of the problems with uh, on-car sensors is they can't see ahead of a truck. So they can see the truck right in front of you, but if that truck is about to get into an accident because the car in front of it is in an accident, um, your car can't see it and doesn't know to slow down. And so everybody's in an emergency stop situation, that, and that's not comfortable, and it, it, it leads to, to worse accidents and not scrubbing off that, uh, energy into an accident. So the, the, the guys at, at Virginia Tech over here are trying to put technology into everybody's car so the car, four cars ahead of you, if it's in an emergency stop situation, it signals to the cars behind it, hey, there's something wrong here on the road, slow down and prepare for emergency stop too. That way everybody behind you can slow down and come to a stop without any accidents, any secondary accidents. A lot, of, a lot of good work is being done in this field to talk to uh, infrastructure. You talk about wearable computers. Um, this is uh, Oakley's wearable computer that has that recon instruments in it. It tells you where on the ski mountain you are, how fast you're going, um, uh, where your kids are. Uh, it lets you chat with your kids if they have an Android phone or an iPhone or another pair of these. Um, and the next ones will have cameras. Uh, it has sensors in it, so it knows the hang time of your last jump, stuff like that, right? So you, this is Google Glass. Now, this is acceptable because it doesn't look uncool, right? It's inside a ski goggle that you're already having to wear anyways. And they sold out. They're 650 bucks. Uh, and they're bigger. Because the ski goggle's bigger, they can put bigger batteries and stuff like that into them, and they're, and they're comfortable, and they're cool. But we're going to see all sorts of new kinds of wearables that assist us in doing certain kinds of tasks. Uh, ODG is working with BMW to make augmented reality glasses for driving. And they talked about get, doing things like getting rid of all the dead zones in your car. Because you can have a camera on your car. And as you look behind you, you'll see in your glasses the view of that camera. And you won't see the dead zone anymore. Or you'll see new kinds of mirrors that you can... Uh, flip back and forth in your glasses, right? Thanks to cameras. <clears throat> We're seeing new kinds of clothing evolve. This is a dress that has a heart rate monitor and then changes its form um, thanks to the heart rate monitor. Now you might say, well, that's sort of stupid, but, um, but it's coming. And er I was sitting with a bunch of, of girls and they were all like, I want that dress at the prom, right? Because it's different, and it can behave different. Even if you walk in with the same dress as somebody else, you can make it behave different, look different than the other person's dress, just with a flip of the switch, right? At CES, we talk to people who are doing new kinds of clothing. This is uh, uh, clothing with a bunch of sensors in it, and the guy who's developing this is developing it for virtual reality applications because he can build a map then of the human body and see you doing all sorts of fun stuff in, in, in a database of this type. And uh, he can make his apps then much more interactive than if you just have two controllers on you. So let's talk about the real world, today's world. <clears throat> Levi Stadium, and this is where the Super Bowl is going to be in a week. You can already walk in with an augmented thing, and there's 2,000 beacons in the stadium. It already knows where you bought your ticket, because you have to buy it on the mobile phone. 
it already knows when you get to the parking lot and it can redirect you before you get to the parking lot. So if there's a parking lot that's uh, flooded for some El Nino reason or something like that, it can say, don't go to parking lot C, go to parking lot A. There are spaces available there. It already does this. It already knows when you check in. It already knows when you walk in the front door of the stadium, right? Because you're walking by one of these Internet of Things devices called the Keysar. This guy is the guy who built it. And they have, uh, I think, 100 of these in the stadium that let you have access to certain parts of the stadium. So if you have VIP uh, access to one of the lounges, uh, you walk by this and it turns green and the security guard watching you says, cool. And if it turns red, <laughs> go back. <laughs> you know? um, but when you walk in the front door of the stadium, they have a brand new 4K screen at the front door of the stadium and your name is up on the front, front stadium sign, right? And at this point, when I tell people this, somebody usually says, I'm turning that shit off, <laughs> right? Because it freaks me out. I don't want to be tracked this way. It's all off, it's all off in. If, if you don't want your name on the, on the stadium sign, you don't have to have it. But you know everybody's going to do that at the Super Bowl. If you had tickets to the Super Bowl, you'd want to turn around, take a selfie, and post that shit to Facebook, right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and I say you're not going to turn it off because, first of all, you might not get access to the stadium. They might force you to have it on just to get access to the stadium. But you won't get food delivered to your seat, right? Because they know where you're sitting. And when you order food, they bring it to you in the stadium. They have 1,200 Wi-Fi hotspots. They have 45 gigabits of internet in and out of the stadium. Verizon built special uh, antennas just for the stadium so your cell phone keeps working. And they put sensors on the bathrooms. <laughs> Talk about freaky shit, right? They know the line length at the bathroom. So when you pull out your phone and say, where's the bathroom? It navigates you to the bathroom that has the shortest line. Already, this is happening today. It's already in place. And they're not alone. These are the beacons. Beacons, for people who don't know what beacons are, they're little radios that spit three numbers in the air every 30th of a second. They cost. These ones cost $15 per piece because they're uh, uh, professional ones from uh, Gimbal. But um, you can buy them for less than $10 in quantity. And they last for two, two years on a set of AA batteries or co coin batteries. They're pretty energy efficient. And you might say, well, that's the stadium. But this is American Airlines. Actually, this is the stadium too. Oh, yeah. I have American Airlines in a couple slides. But this is the navigation around the stadium. And <clears throat> this year, the, the, these three guys, uh, two of which started Siri, are coming out with a company called Viv. And Siri has some problems when you're talking to these systems, right? Siri, if you ask Siri uh, how many people are checked in here on Foursquare, it understands you just fine. At least it understands me just fine. It gets that right 100% of the time. Foursquare has an answer to that question. They know how many people here are checked in on Foursquare right now. And Foursquare has an API, but it has not been hooked up. Uh, if you look at the back end of Siri, it's hard-coded. There's 80 lines of code that Apple has to write to take the noun, the adjective, the verbs of what you uttered and convert it into an API call to Foursquare. Well, Viv uh, says we are fixing all those problems. One, the bottom of it is open. So Foursquare can say, anytime you see, you hear the word Foursquare, just shove all that data to us and we'll figure it out, right? Uh, and, a, and they can work together because it's open. Two, the Viv system writes the code as you talk. So in one twentieth of a second, it writes the 80 lines of code for you, after you, you know, as you talk. Therefore, it's not hard-coded. It's very flexible. And as the system uh, gets new inputs, it can change in reaction to that input. Because if we all use Viv, the system will get smarter. And the system needs to be flexible. It also understands longer query types than Siri does because of that flexibility. And the third thing is um, this thing has a neural network that's very advanced computer science and it's learning from all of us and from its own engineers and fourth it it builds a profile 
So if you say, please deliver me a large pepperoni pizza from Round Table, it puts all that stuff in a profile that you can see. That's a huge change. And you can co correct. So if, if it got it wrong, you can correct it. But the next time you order pizza, you don't have to say large pepperoni pizza from Round Table. You just have to say, order me the same pizza I got last time. Or just order me a pizza. And it'll say what Alexa did with toilet paper. Oh, the last pizza you ordered was from Round Table, and it was a large pepperoni pizza. Do you want that? Yes. Boom. Right? It saves you typing. It saves you talking. And if you're in a car, that's really cool. So you add on the bib system to the other systems I'm talking about. And this is American Airlines. And they, in Chicago and a few other airports, have mapped out the airport in completion. They know where every bathroom is, where every info counter is, where every gate is, where every sushi restaurant is, blah, blah, blah. And they know where you are, down to one meter. You're a little blue dot inside the, the airport at this now because they, they have systems, and I'll show you one of them, that helps uh, figure out where you are. So you ask it where is the closest bathroom, and it navigates you there inside the airport, right? This is coming to shopping malls and other places that have large indoor spaces. And it's more of the American Airlines. This is a Cisco Wi-Fi router. They put it in a space like this. It has 32 little antennas around the edges, and it knows where you are, plus or minus a meter. Wi-Fi. Who knew? So soon our buildings are going to know where we are and are going to be able to add on all sorts of things. Well, let's talk about some of the, the entrepreneurs who are doing things with our location. <clears throat> this guy started uh, uh, Zoran in Israel, but his kid is the one to watch. Daniel uh, started this company called Tapingo, Tap and Go. And it's being used at 150 college campuses. I'm not sure if Virginia Tech is one of them, but uh, Santa Clara University is. And at Santa Clara University already, 70% of all transactions are going through his system because you use it to buy your books, you use it to buy your lunch, you use it to buy t-shirts, you use it to buy anything around the campus that you can. And so if you wake it up at seven in the morning, you have Topingo. I think I have some pictures of what it looks like. You say, I'd like a iced latte. And the system says, your iced latte will be ready at 7.29 a.m. from Starbucks at so-and-so street. And you go into that Starbucks at 7.29, you walk in, you grab your latte, and you leave. You don't tap anything, you don't talk to anybody, you don't t touch anything, you just grab the latte and leave. And you might say, well, that's weird. Well, you can already do that at Apple stores today with the Apple app, right? Have you guys, any of you done that? You can buy an Apple power supply, go into the Apple store, grab it off the shelf, and leave. And nobody ever says anything to you. And I asked the security guard how they know not to bother you. He says, oh, your photos are here, or your info is here. We expected you to do that. And we're watching you. <laughs> we know that somebody bought an Apple power supply, and your beacon in your phone warned us because we know when you're within 30 feet of us. And it says, Robert Scoville just entered the store, and it's OK if he takes an Apple power supply off the shelf, <laughs> right? Now, it won't work for a MacBook. Anything with a serial number, you have to actually talk to somebody. But it works for anything without a serial number, right, in the store. And Topingo works the same way. So, um, and, and that was last year's model. This year's model, he knows where every customer is in real time. So if you're in the Starbucks already, and you also go to something close to my classroom, it'll tell you hey, can you pick up Robert Scoville's latte and take it to class, and you'll get some Topingo dollars. Now, the Topingo dollars are a virtual currency. It's uh, his own form of Bitcoin. It's a cryptocurrency. So he's getting rid of Visa out of this situation. And so why do we need Visa in such a world? This kid is going to tear apart Visa, and he's already rich enough to not need to sell because his dad started Zoran and is a venture capitalist with $8 billion under management, right? So this family already has enough money. They don't need more money. He's doing it for fun, and he's really smart <laughs> to boot. Uh, he was in the Israeli 8200 program, and he was in the surveillance program. 
So he learned a few things in surveillance. He, t he told me a, a few things he learned. He said, I learned everybody has a common pattern in life and government surveillance wants to see if you're out of pattern, right? I live a, in a farming community. E even though I'm in a farming community, if I buy a, a ton of fertilizer and a, a, a 400 gallons of diesel fuel, somebody's gonna visit me, right? Because I'm not a farmer. It, no, the system knows I'm not a farmer. And I, I gave the speech to a bunch of security people in DC and they said, one, one came up to me afterwards, he goes, we watch the farmer too. <laughs> We have a satellite that watches if the farmer puts the nitrate on the farm and spreads it out. And if he doesn't, we come and visit him too because we don't want nobody storing nitrate that turns into Timothy McVeigh-style bombs around our country, right? He doesn't care if you're out of pattern. That, he said that's the government's job. He cares if you're in pattern. So if you buy the same iced latte every morning, it just says, would you like your normal iced latte? Because you buy the same damn thing at 7 in the morning every morning. And you say yes, and it saves you clicks on the phone, and it increases sales. Reducing friction increases sales. This company is the downtown company. Um, if you go into C Coupa Cafe in Palo Alto, which is uh, a cool place for, to meet with VCs and stuff like that, the old way of ordering was to get off the table, go stand in line, uh, and that would take 10 or 20 minutes, <laughs> order something, wait for it, and then go pick it up and take it back to the table. The new way is you just pull out your iPhone and use the downtown app, and it, they deliver it to your table. There's a beacon on each uh, table, so it knows you're at table 13, and there's an iPad uh, by the cashier that uh, tells them a new order was placed. When they put this uh, uh, system in place, sales went up 25% the first week because it took pain away from ordering. If you take pain away from people's lives, you can build really big companies like Uber, right? Uber used this technology to make getting a ride easier. Um, House Call is a company in San Diego, actually started by the guys who built the gimbal for Qualcomm, the, the beacon. So, they, they know the mobile world pretty well. This thing, you uh, order a carpet cleaner or a guy to uh, put your, your TV on the wall or uh, a roofer or plumber, anything for the house. And they've standardized pricing and they've uh, made it so that only customers can write reviews so you don't have the Yelp problem of bad reviews. Um, you see all the schedules for the plumber up front, and, and that's the trick to why this system is so popular. Um, and on Tuesday, when the plumber's supposed to come to your house, you see them coming to your house like Uber. You know, you see the Uber driver driving toward you. Same thing with this. And all the messaging with the plumber is done through the system, and all the payment is done through the system. And when, when I asked him to show me how many customers they had, the, the whole city of San Diego was red when they showed me the back end. And I said, how do you get so many customers so quickly? And he goes, well, we have the best um, monetization system for plumbers. We have the best scheduling system for plumbers. And they force everybody to get on the system so that they can do business with you, with them, because that's the best way to schedule them. And it, it increases customer satisfaction numbers, right? So sales go up, customer satisfaction numbers go up, and all that. But think about the world that's coming at us soon with augmented reality glasses. We're going to just say, hey, I need a... I need somebody to clean my carpet to the glasses and it's going to order that automatically and it's going to say is $50 okay, is next Tuesday okay, um, you know, and here's the details. <clears throat> You're being tracked when you go around the world. Um, the company you can't see is sh shelf bucks. They have a little sensor that sits in grocery aisles now and you tap your phone to the grocery, to the display and it knows you're there and so it tells you all sorts of stuff on your on your Safeway app or whatever store you have uh, app. And it gives you coupons, like $2 off the Oreos because you're standing in the Oreo aisle. It knows you're there. And aisle 411 is another one. There's a whole bunch of companies that are doing this. Smart grocery stores are coming soon. Anyways, th this thing has nine radios. It knows where you're standing. It doesn't need to be tapped. It already knows you didn't walk by the cookies when you got to the, to the milk. And it can, when you get to the milk, it can say that to your mobile phone. 
hey, why don't you go down the cookie aisle? Don't you want some cookies with this milk, <laughs> right? Add-ons, right? All sorts of fun stuff. And you might say, well, that's a grocery store, but there's co other companies doing it for other industries. Vintank is um, a company that studies any time you say something about wine on social networks. And think about what one tweet tells me about you. If you tweet, for instance, if you go to Napa, a wine region with 450 wineries, and you go to Camus, and you say, and you just tweet, I just bought a case of Camus's best Cabernet. What did you just tell me? You, what, you're rich. That's right. Because it's $200 a bottle. And so you told me you make more than $100,000 a year. Right there. Because you're not going to buy that if you don't have $100,000 a year or family money or something, right? You're rich. Two, it tells me you know something about wine. Because you don't go to Camus if you don't know anything about wine. If you don't know anything about wine, you go to Mondavi or Sutter Home where there's $10 a bottle of wine. They're a Rackspace customer, by the way, so I can't talk bad about them, but their wine is $10 for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> and they know it. They sell millions of cases of their wine because it's low price compared to Camus, right? So you, you say, I just went and bought a case of Sutter Home. I know something that's different than if you say, I bought a case of Camus. And if I own Paradox, I'm taking the Camus owner straight to the reserve room because that'll maximize profit. And if I see the Sutter Home user coming in my front door, I take them to the cheaper side of my, fa of my winery because I know they're buying $10 bottles of wine. They're not going to be interested in the $100 bottles of wine. And all they're going to do is drink the wine for free and not appreciate it. So <laughs> I'm going to maximize profit. Now you might say, well, that's wineries. But I talked to the R&D guys at Harley-Davidson, they're putting face detection in their stores for Harley-Davidson. It's coming. We're being stalked. So uh, let's get back to VR a little bit uh, and end up there. Um, I went to Facebook and got a, this demo uh, of Oculus Rift. If it plays. Nope. Well. Maybe it won't play because my screen size is too weird. Well, what I, I, it won't play. So what I saw was um, they asked me to hold two controllers. And these controllers could tell where in space they were. So as I moved them around, they, I saw my hands in virtual space. And we could play ping pong over the internet with two people. Think about that one. Ball. You hit it, ball back, and it looks like real ping pong. The controllers let you shoot, let you throw a football, let you punch, uh, let you do archery. It's so accurate at aiming things that you can shoot an arrow at a target. Um, you can light things on fire. There's a, a little uh, thing, and that, that was what I was going to show you. It's mind-blowing, and that's coming this summer, right? This stuff is going to change our expectations of entertainment, of shopping, of driving, of living life in a very deep way. And w w even the innovators here are still talking about what the impacts might be because we're all starting to dream about it because it's coming and it's becoming real. So thank you very much. So we're, where's my friends who are the self-driving Self-driving cars? Who was, this, who was the guy who was the self-driving car guy? I, I'm sorry, I, I forget. My face ram is so full that I can't remember faces or names anymore. But how many people are freaked out here by this kind of stuff? A few. Usually a third of my audiences are freaked out by this talk. Um, and that shows that we have a marketing job and a trust uh, gap to get over. And we have to build systems that gain that trust. I mean, when you start talking about self-driving cars with normal people, they usually tell me, I don't like that. I like the idea of driving. I like to drive, right? They use words like that. Very emotional and very cultural words that are going to take years to convince many people that Actually, you don't want to drive most of the time. You know, okay, if you're in the TV commercial on a curvy road on a sunny day with a convertible, yeah, I want to drive there too. <laughs> but in traffic in Sao Paulo, no, right? 
And do you want to die? No. <laughs> 33,000 people die a year in cars. You, you know, you turn this stuff on and uh, bumper sales at Mercedes have already gone down 30% with just front-facing radar. Already, this stuff by not getting turned on is killing people. And we need to turn it around to uh, expect, explain that and make it so that people want to buy cars with this technology and drive them and then want to buy an Amazon Echo that's listening to you full time, right? Alexa. What else is it listening for? I don't know. But I do know, you know, when, when people start pushing back, I said, you're going to use it. And here's an example of why. I use an app called TripIt. Does anybody use TripIt here? Yeah, a few TripIt users. TripIt, when, when the CEO came and visited me and explained it, <clears throat> TripIt is hooked into the air traffic control system. And that's really important because if the air traffic control system says your flight's being canceled, your flight's being canceled, because if you're a pilot, any pilots in here? Any, anybody who flies, right? When you're a pilot, you have to report any change in your air traffic control behavior, right? Uh, if you're not gonna take off, you have to report that to air traffic control and say, sorry, I decided not to fly today, I'm going back to the gate. So I was sitting in Chicago, I was flying home, we were, near the runway, we were on the, run, on the tarmac, and TripIt said my flight's being canceled. Now TripIt also has access to my Gmail. So think about that one for a second. TripIt's owned by Concur, a public company, and I give them permission to go into my email and look around. I have no idea what they're really doing in there. You know? And by the way, so is Google, and so is the NSA, and I really don't care. But <coughs> TripIt, I give explicit permission to look around, for things. Now, they say they're looking for flight tickets and hotel reservations and Uber t receipts, stuff like that, right? And they take that stuff over to TripIt and say, oh, your flight is on Tuesday at 3 p.m. and they tell you all sorts of stuff about your flight. They also ask for my GPS so that they would know where I actually am. And they ask for my credit card. Think about this. Com I give a lot of data to this company. And a lot of people in my audiences are really queasy about giving this data to the company. But it pays off because that night, TripIt said my flight's being canceled. Will you like a ticket out of town on some other airline? And I took it. It turns out there was only three seats on that other airline. Two minutes later, the pilot came on and said, I can't start a jet engine and we're going back to the gate. And you guys all are gonna have to see our customer service people because we don't have another flight, another plane tonight. So, the rest of the pastors spent the night in Chicago. And you're gonna hear story after story after story like that where this technology saves lives, changes lives, saves you an hour on the freeway if you use Waze, which we didn't even talk about, um, and saves your life and uh, makes your life more enjoyable if you have a self-driving car, on and on, right? So, questions? So. It's all cool technology, but how do you stop somebody from taking it over? That's, I mean, that's the that's, that's German. Of, I, I see, I see. I asked Mercedes, why don't you do uh, over-the-air updates like Elon Musk is doing with the Tesla? And they said exactly that. They said, how do you take some, keep somebody out of our systems and hacking our cars? And we don't want the brand damage that comes from hacking our car. Yeah. It's a real deep, hard question. I say, you're gonna have some hacks, but you're gonna have to build systems that are very resistant to it. And the Israelis are working on it. I know at Rackspace we're spending many millions of dollars to figure out security in new ways. Um, some of the Israeli technology I saw actually makes a, uh, a virtual model of everything on the system and is looking at what its acceptable um, behavior should be and looks for things that are outliers. Um, to, that, to that model and, uh, you know, a, a computer in your factory is streaming data to China. That probably wouldn't be a good model for your factory, right? I, I have a feeling you don't have any customers in China, so why is it telling China a lot of data? And right now, if you don't have systems like that that are watching that, you probably don't even know about that, that computer that's giving data over to China. But in the future, you're going to know and you're going to be able to shut that down virtually and uh, and have bots that actually shut it down before you even get warned, right? Well, not so much. I can, the easiest way to defeat an automated system is to feed a contradictory sensory data. 
Yeah. So. Give me an example. How would you? Your, your, your wine app. I mean, if I break in and I say that you are the one that orders the two hundred dollar a bottle wine app, that's one thing. All right. The data about you now. If I find out that you you sell, you buy rather this, these cases of wine, whether it's the ten dollar, the two hundred dollar, but you buy three a week. Now I can have an idea that you're an alcoholic, and so you know we can do that type of stuff by feeding. But the here's the answer. The, the cops are saying, oh, I, I can put fake cop data into Waze, for instance. I love Waze because it tells me where the cops are on Freeway 280 and uh, lets me slow down before I get to their radar guns, right? <laughs> and the cops are all, well, I can go to the freeway and put down a, a cop marker and you'll slow down. Har, har, har. First of all, okay, I slowed down. Big deal. Second of all, when I get to the cop data, Waze lets me report there's no cop there. And if, if enough drivers keep doing that to your account, then all of a sudden your account doesn't get the rights to put cop data down anymore, right? We can build systems that are very defensible against this. My Gmail, for instance, did you know that everybody here has a Gmail score? No, most people don't, and you can't see the score. You have a score on how good are you at putting things into the spam folder, and how good are you at taking things out of the spam folder. You didn't even know that. You're being scored on how good you are at that. It doesn't matter to you. All you care about is the, is the right thing in the spam folder or not, right? But um, what it's doing is watching and only letting people who are good at it affect the system for everybody else. So me, I know I have a high score because I met the guys who built the team and I put a lot of stuff in the spam folder. Um, and I get a lot, my email account is a honeypot because it, it was on the internet for a decade in public view. So I get a thousand spams a day that go into the spam folder. And so I have a lot more flow. My wife only gets two, right? And so my score is very high. So if I put something in the spam folder, it affects all of you. And if I take something out of the spam folder, it affects all of you, right? But if you're really bad at it, if you, keep, if you throw all your brother's stuff in the spam folder and you throw a legitimate email in the spam folder, um, then it figures out pretty quickly that you're really bad at it and it gives you a really low score and then you can't affect it. U Uber works the same way, right? Uber, you get to rate the driver. And if they get less than a 4.5 average, they get fired, right? So if you're giving somebody not a five, you're firing them. You're asking them to, to get fired. And they're rating you as well. And I have had many a driver who said, if you have a less than a four, three, four, one, they won't pick you up, and they certainly won't pick you up on a really busy night, right? Because they'll have lots of competition uh, for people to pick up, and they'd rather pick up the nice person than the asshole, right? And they'll see that on their screen. They see the rating on their screen when they are accepting rides, and they can cancel you and then go on and pick up another customer, and they will, right? So you have an incentive to be a nice person to the driver, which makes the whole system better over time, right? And so I think... It's those systems that are going to make hacking harder and harder over time um, and make bad actors uh, less and less valuable to the system over time. But we're going to go through a time where we need the bad actors to show the weaknesses in the system. And Tesla is already learning more about security than Mercedes is because they open their system up and they're going to take the risk. And it requires us to take risks with each other. And we're in a trust economy. And Elon is getting the benefit of taking that risk as long as he doesn't get burned too badly. Now, he might get burned. And there might be a huge scandal tomorrow. Every Tesla gets hacked by teenagers and they can drive your car away, right? But they can already drive your car away with a... My, my Toyota Prius was just broken into with a, a, a power extender device that costs $100 and they can already unlock your car. They can already start it. So. We're already being hacked, was the answer. We just need to build systems that are more hack resistant. And that's tough, that's engineering. And that's what a lot of people in this room are doing. Well, thank you for doing that work. Anything else? Yeah. So obviously with all this technology, you need a broadband connectivity. Um, 
where do you... And cloud. <laughs> There's right. a reason Rackspace keeps me employed. <laughs> well, right now in Blacksburg, we have a couple of companies, you know, working on getting us other alternatives in broadband, but we really have one, Comcast. Yeah. Where do you see that going? I've looked into, you know, 5G uh, internet. What, what do you think here in the next few years? Uh, I'm paying a shitload to Verizon. I mean, I, I, I just increased my order $75 a month because I'm using so much video to do these live videos on Verizon. But, uh, and Verizon, by the way, is stunning how good the quality is. I, I've done now in the last four days, 15 live videos in two different communities, and I have not had a drop. I had one drop underneath the supercomputer in Illinois, because I was downstairs where there was no connectivity, right? And I flipped over to Wi-Fi and it started working again. But um, we're beholden to companies who have cell towers. That's, that's where this self-driving cars are gonna need it, your glasses are gonna need it, your phone needs it already, right? And we're beholden to Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, and we have to pay the price um, for that infrastructure. Can we, um, can we build cheaper systems? Yeah, there's uh, cheaper Wi-Fi systems coming, longer range Wi-Fi systems coming. Um, can a community like this have free gigabit Ethernet, uh, Wi-Fi in the, in the quad? Yes, you, you guys do. I don't have it in my, in my community. Um, but yeah, it's a real problem. It's, it, bandwidth and broadband is a necessary precondition and it's a real problem in many communities. I don't know the answer, translation. <laughs> yeah, other than you get, when you have population density, you do get better services. It actually, it, we should talk about that. You know, when my dad moved to Silicon Valley, he didn't want to live in downtown San Jose because that's where the bad services were, that's where the crime was. That's where um, there was a shitty school, stuff like that, right? They, everybody wanted to live in suburbs, and this explains L.A., why it's an endless suburb, because everybody wanted to live in the suburb. They didn't want to live where there was high population density. Today, that's turning around. You're getting better services in the urban centers because of free gigabit e Wi-Fi, uh, Uber it visits far more often. Uh, in San Francisco, I can get... Uh, groceries delivered, food delivered, salads delivered in 20 minutes that cost $10, on and on. I can't get that in my house that's 45 minutes away from San Francisco because it's, it's too unpopulated for those services. And so we're already seeing population shifts where people want to live downtown where they can get really good broadband because it's cheaper for Verizon to put up a lot of cell towers to make sure that that area is covered. It's harder to cover a farm, a farmer who has, you know, one person per hundred acres or a thousand acres, right? Anything we got time for one more question. All right. This is fun. Yeah. There's one here. Let's see. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, what is your opinion on lower cost virtual reality like uh, Gear VR or I suppose Google Cardboard? Yeah. That it's not the same full experience as the Rift? Or Vive? Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So th the reason, uh, the, the Oculus Rift, the, S the Sony PlayStation VR, and, and the Vive, the Valve Vive, are using much better GPUs, pr particularly the Oculus and the Valve. And the, the, the NVIDIA cards that you're using in the high-end gaming systems have 40,000 cores in them. The, uh, GPU in your phone has 4,000 cores on a high-end phone. So you, you, right away, you can't throw as many polygons at my eyes with a mobile phone as you can with a, a, an Oculus or a Valve. So there's going to be a gap there. On the converse, with the Valve and the Oculus, I'm tethered. So I have a wire coming out of the back that needs to be tethered to the PC. And I, I can walk around in a little box, but I can't walk around town or I can't go... I can't take it on a bus and watch a movie on a, on a plane or something like that. So I think we're going to have different glass. I already have different glass. So I'm carrying around a couple that you can put the phone into uh, so you can use VR while you're you know, out with your friends somewhere else. Um, it's going to be a gap for a while. I mean, I, uh, the, the people who built the Valve say, hey, we have two sensors on the wall that are watching you you know, spraying light on you and watching and building this virtual box that you can walk around and you can't do that on a mobile phone. 
you, you have controllers in your hands that are very low latency sensors and very, very high quality. You can't do that on a mobile phone. Although uh, there's a company that, that CES that showed pretty nice controllers, but they're not as nice as the Oculus or the Valve. And the, the OLED screens that they're using in the, in the Valve and the Oculus are higher quality than a cell phone screen is today on average. <coughs> and, and they have sensors in here that are watching your head move so it's lower late. When you move around with an Oculus, it has lower latency and all that. So it's a more enjoyable experience on the, on the high-end ones. And that's life. It's been my life, my entire life. When you spend $3,000 on a computer, you get a really nice computer. And the $1,000 one is OK. And the $500 one is shit, right? And today, you, yeah, you can get cardboard. I have a Google Cardboard. It, it's fun for a lot of things, but it, it's not as nice as the Samsung Gear VR. And it's certainly not as nice as the high-end headsets that can do really, really immersive, low latency, interactive things where I'm playing ping pong over the internet. I can't do that with a Google Cardboard. No. Answer is you got to pay to play right now. Sorry. <laughs> uh, or stay alive. Because I remember the day when Steve Wozniak showed me his dye sublimation color printer. He had the first color printer that I'd seen in Silicon Valley. It was 1989. Photoshop One had just shipped. He had a, this printer, it cost $45,000. Today, a $70 printer is cheap, is better. A $70 printer is better than that one. And he had a 400 megabyte RAM disk, megabyte, not gigabyte, 400 megabyte RAM disk that cost $40,000 to run Photoshop. And today, our phones have way more RAM than that, right? And faster. So <clears throat> if you can't afford something today, stay alive. <laughs> Moore's Law, or whatever you call the law, is working in your favor. It's going to bring the Rich Voice toy to you in a low cost. <laughs> so thank you very much.